Hello everyone! In this video we will derive rotation and reflection matrices for two dimensions, which we will use to construct E irreducible representation for C3D. At the end of the video I will introduce you to square diagonal matrix and we will deepen our understanding of irreducible representations. Quick recap of trigonometry. If I label sides of this right triangle as follows, then sine and cosine are y over d and x over d respectively. Now let's place this triangle in a circle in the coordinate system, so that vertex p of the triangle is in the perimeter of the circle. Now you can see that this distance is x and this distance is y and the formulas hold. This circle is known as a unit circle, unit because d is chosen as one, and it allows us to find values for trigonometric functions for any angle. Now we can do a nice trick. We can express x and y in terms of sine, cosine and the radius, so now we can easily describe position of any point in 2D. Let's start with rotation matrix. We have some position vector, Q, position because it starts at 0, 0, it is placed at the angle alpha to the x-axis, now let's imagine that we rotate this vector by an angle theta and we get Q prime. Position vector has the same coordinate as the end point and if you're not a fan of vectors, you might forget that it's a vector and imagine that we're only rotating a point. It will be written down in exactly the same way. So point Q has this coordinate and Q prime has this coordinates. Notice that we have sum of angles. Now we have to use the formula for the sum of sines and cosines, so the new coordinates looks like this. And the next step is to substitute d sine alpha and d cos alpha, and we are almost done. We just need to notice that these two terms need to be swapped, and we can express the entire thing like that, where x and y are the coordinates of any point or any position vector. So the general expression of the character of the rotation matrix in 2D is 2 cos theta. Also notice that cos alpha and cos minus alpha have the same value, because they share the same x value and cosine is x over d. That means that the character of our matrix is independent of the sense of rotation. Therefore, Cn1 will have the same character as Cnn minus 1, for instance C31 has the same character as C32, 2 being n minus 1. Anyway, now reflection matrix. So we need a point and a plane of reflection, let's call the angle from the point to the plane beta. When the reflection happens, the point L will end up on the other side of the reflection plane, separated from the plane by beta as well. Now we need some more symbols, let's call alpha plus beta theta and theta plus beta gamma. Why do that? Well, we ideally want to express our reflection using the angle theta, that is by the angle at which the reflection plane is placed with respect to the x-axis. Alpha is also useful because we want to do the same kind of substitution as for the rotation matrix. Therefore, let's solve for beta and let's substitute it to the equation 1. So it turns out that gamma is 2 theta minus alpha. That will allow us to describe the L prime point as follows. And then we need to expand the difference of trigonometric functions. The formulas are below. Then substitution and the full equation is as follows. The reflection matrix in 2D will always have character equal to zero regardless of the angle, which is a very satisfying result. So with these two formulas we can easily write matrices for rotation, the angle is 120 and 240. We have seen that the character for rotation matrix is independent of the angle of rotation, so it's all good. Just for the record, here the rotation is anticlockwise because that is how we derived it. Uh, mathematicians are fond of anticlockwise rotations because rotation from x positive arm anticlockwise gives, by convention, a positive angle. Then we insert angles to the reflection matrix, only remember that we need to double the angle and that's it. So notice that these are exactly the same matrices that we've seen a couple of videos ago. Davidson emphasizes that it's necessary to confirm that these matrices mirror the relationship between the operations themselves. If the Cayley table for the operations and the matrices does not have one-to-one -one correspondence, then we've made a mistake in deriving the matrices. In our case, it's all fine. Now I would like to talk about a slight confusion that you might experience if you follow these two books, one by Davidson and the second by Ogden. They have slightly different derivation. So let's look at the generic matrix for rotation once again. Let's change it so that the rotation is clockwise. So we need to substitute minus theta for theta, and so we have cos minus theta is cos theta, and sine minus theta is minus sine theta. And we have a matrix for clockwise rotation. And notice that these matrices will arrive for rotating a point. So let's look at it closer. Let's take C for V, 
under C4, Vx becomes Vy and Vy becomes minus Vx, anti-clockwise rotation. This is somewhat close to our hearts because I told you that x and y under E means that we have some entity with x and y directionality into converting into one another. And we were demonstrating that on P orbitals. And a similar relationship exists for a point. So let's say we have a point P on the x-axis with coordinates a0, then if we rotate it, the coordinates will be 0a, they swap. So the resulting coordinates are mixtures of the original coordinates. So it doesn't matter if you rotate a point in 2D, which is defined by x and y coordinates, or x and y vectors. Ogden derives rotation matrix for a point, and Davidson avoids this apparent confusion altogether by deriving rotation matrix for x and y vectors. He rotates clockwise, he expresses the new vectors in terms of the old ones. So notice that Tx prime has y component that is negative, because we need to reverse Ty. It needs to point downwards. And for Ty prime, x component is sine, not cosine, because the angle is here, not here, like what we saw a couple of slides ago. So the relationship is that anti-clockwise rotation for a point has the same matrix as clockwise rotation for x and y vectors. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter, because all that matters are characters which are exactly the same, but if you really follow the text, it might be a bit confusing for you, especially in Ogden, because he changes between the two systems without any comments. Now I would like to expand on the topic of irreducible representations. But before I can do that, I need to introduce you to block diagonal matrix. Block diagonal matrix is a square diagonal matrix in which the diagonal elements are square matrices of any size and the off diagonal elements are zeros. So here we see a block diagonal matrix made of 2x2 two two and 1x1 one one blocks. And here's another made of three one by one blocks. Now let's look at some property that block diagonal matrices have. Let's take two matrices that are blocked out along the diagonal in the same way. Now let's multiply them. The resulting matrix has also two blocks. Now let's take two by two matrices, which are identical as the two by two blocks from the diagonal matrices. When we multiply them, the resulting two by two matrix is the same as this two by two block. So this property allows us to treat the blocks independently when we perform multiplication. Now let's come back to the matrices that we derived. Let's see what happens if we extend them by introducing a z-component. Now our point has a z-coordinate as well, so these matrices describe three-dimensional space. But the z-coordinate does not change by rotation around z-axis or by reflection in a plane that is perpendicular to the xy-plane, that is sigma v. So it's one under every operation. Now we can see that our 3x3 three three matrices are square diagonal matrices. They are made from 2x2 two two and 1x1 one one blocks. All the other entries are zeros. We know that the 2x2 two two block corresponds to E representation, so what is the 1x1 one one block? The entries are 1, 1, 1, so that would be A1, and indeed, when we look at the character table, we see that Z is described by A1. So we can write it down like that, tau xyz equals e plus a1. xyz are the basis of our representation. Just remind you, the vectors, functions, used to obtain the representation, reducible or irreducible, are said to form the basis of that representation. And also please recall that tau is a symbol used for reducible representation. The 3x3 matrices are reducible because they can be brought into this block diagonal form, and the blocks are the irreducible representations. So irreducible representation is a representation that cannot be reduced more, cannot be forced into a block diagonal form. We also know from the previous slide that the blocks can be multiplied independently and effectively treated independently. Very nice and convenient. As I said earlier, there is virtually infinite number of reducible representations, depending on what vectors or functions we take as a basis for our representation. But they can always be decomposed to some combination of irreducible representations. So as I said earlier, irreducible representations are like building blocks. One more thing, just notice that for E and sigma v1 matrices, you could say that they are made by three one by one blocks, but we need to consider all of the other matrices for all the other operations, and they have to break into the same blocks, and the rest of the matrices break only to two blocks. So that's all I have for you today, I hope it helps, thank you for watching, and see you in the next video!